We can well, you gotta let it... Alright, one thing I want to bring up is if physics shows us that inside of an object of infinite density, there can be no time, and uh, many speakers have brought it up before, that in the beginning of the universe, time, matter, light, energy was all created. So if there is an object of infinite density in which there can be no time, and there was no time for a creator to have created the world. It could have, in essence, just came into existence, because time as we know it came into existence. There was no before. The second point I'd like to make is that the only reason that God has existed since the beginning of humanity is to explain what humans couldn't understand using science and actual facts. Just the basis upon which all religion is placed, faith, is the most illogical thing you could possibly imagine. There's evidence of faith in uh, like our daily lives, like when you go to sleep you have faith that you'll wake up in the morning. No, faith doesn't exist inside the human world. What exists inside the human world is trust. You only believe something if there's sufficient evidence to lead you to believe something. People always say, well, disprove that there's a God. Something that can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So since there is no way to prove a god, you don't need to disprove a god. Uh, Elton, did you have your hand up? Uh, sure. Well, here's the other thing about science. I'm not arguing in favor of God or not in favor of God. All I'm saying is that in science, it is still done by humans and I don't know about you, but if you want the ultimate truth, I don't think you can trust human senses in any se in any case. Because what we see, what we perceive, is not necessarily what is actually there. If you want a good example, our eyesight, for example, we see in color. Well, bees see in ultraviolet. See, as you can see, perception is very different. And all you need, if science is based off of perception, and we can't trust perceptions. So therefore, while you say that blind faith in religion is not good, blind faith can happen also in science. Um, how about, here, here, uh, state your name, also. Uh, uh, I'm Nicholas, I've been uh, in the Christian faith for a couple of years. Um, I have noticed that, yeah, science is more blind than uh, us looking at, at something really far away, like let's say there was a diff distant system about a gajillion miles away. Would we be able to see who's on that? No. Will we be able to know if it was there before us? No. So, this is like the throwing a blanket on something you don't even see. It's like air. You can't see it and then when you throw a blanket on it, you can actually see it catch the blanket. You don't see it. You can't smell it. You can't even notice it's there unless you're breathing it. And if you had a hard time breathing, you can't use that, could you? Um, <laughs> I'm Anthony, and um, I just want to touch on what Ken said, uh, what he was talking about at the beginning there, of how there's one God, and that means there's got to be something that created that God, if we can assume, safely assume that nothing came out of, or something came out of nothing. Um, and that is what is known as Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor is a form of logic that you may or may not be familiar with. What it states is that the um, simplest explanation is probably the most correct, or one that makes the least amount of assumptions is the most correct. So to assert that there is a God, then that is assuming, that is making one assumption. Now, to assert that there is another God above him, that is making a second assumption. To assert that there is another God before him, and it will continue on infinitely. Um, this goes to, this uh, correlates into a more secular belief, which is that there are no gods, making only one assumption in the universe, therefore a more plausible assumption. Dang, these guys. <laughs> so which part of the science textbook would you guys like, left or right? <laughs> Alright, let's over here. Okay, coming back to Occam's Razor, I'm very glad you brought that up. Occam's Razor applied to causality is you do not multiply causes beyond necessity. Well, since the universe began to exist, there is a necessity for a cause. What you don't do is you, keep, you don't continue on to uh, bring up these causes and asking, well, what caused that and what caused that and what caused that, like this gentleman over here did. Uh, you also made a very common mistake. You think that I said anything that exists has a cause. It's anything that begins to exist has a cause. Nobody asserts that God ever began to exist, so your objection uh, does not apply to that. Uh, the gentleman over here says we can't trust our senses. Uh, but that is a self-defeating statement. 
Uh, he literally undercuts himself when he says, you can't trust what humans say. I, a human, say this. It's a self-defeating statement. It's self-destruct. Uh, as for the, the money transfer, he's right. Things do transfer around. But what we're transferring from is heat to absolute cold. It's heat, death. I'm not saying that everything dissipates and disappears. I'm saying we go from warmth to absolute coldness. So there is a transport, and the very fact that we haven't hit this heat death is proof in itself that the universe has not always existed. Please go to the pool area, Elizabeth Thanks. Castro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, just before I start, guys, though, I'd like to remind you all that this is not a, like a Christian versus atheist debate. This is like. You know, is there something who, or someone who made us? This isn't about the Bible, this isn't about the Quran or any specific religious text. It's about gods in general. So, moving on, um, I'd like to bring out the point that Ken made one more time. He said that there had to be a cause to God, right? Well, I'd just like to say this. First off, um, let's look at the universe as it started. It started um, on, at the one point of the Big Bang, right? And we have to assume that something triggered the Big Bang because, as Let's look at Newton's first law of physics. It says that a velocity remains constant unless an external force applies on it. In other words, this chair isn't going to move unless I kick it. Okay, it's not just going to move if I just leave it be, right? So in the same sense, in the same sense, um, the universe had to start because something triggered it. If there was matter before time, and ma then and something caused the Big Bang within the matter, something had to agitate the matter. And in this case, this agitation caused natural laws. And that in of itself states that Yes, there is something which can defeat and create natural laws. And Merriam-Webster defines God as a being or object believed to have more than natural attributes or powers. In other words, something that can do things outside the realms of natural law, which is to say creating natural law, right? I mean, if I create time, I'm clearly above time itself. So, is, so did God have to start? Not necessarily, because he defies all natural laws. So you can't say that, because natural laws say that something has to have begun, that he has to have began because natural laws in and of itself don't apply to it. So God does never have to have started existing. Yeah. Um, so, um, and by the way, guys, uh, if you guys are scared of speech, do not worry. All of your opinions matter to us. That's why we have this like large amount of people in JSA. So don't be scared to speak. If anyone tries to like make you feel bad about speaking, I will personally like. The other side of the okay, Beyond. I've heard your point stated many times, and it's so convenient for theologists to say that because they state that God is outside of time and outside of space, that he therefore is not bound by the laws of it. Like, there's no proof to this statement. All I, that's like saying that I, I can fly, and because I can fly in another dimension that you can't perceive, you don't, you can't disprove that I can fly. It's just faulty logic. <clears throat> yes. God. If we take a moment and assume that I'm a 2D stick figure, right? The law of the laws of the 2D stick figure world apply to me, okay? I can get smashed from here and I can get smashed from behind. I can't get smashed from the side. If I move out of the second dimension, the laws of the second dimension no longer apply to me, okay? I can't just get smashed by a car in the front and smashed by a car in the back. I have two more, you know, two more areas to look out for, right? And in the same way, if God is outside the realms of the physical universe, he's not a stick figure like us. He isn't stuck to two dimensions. There's a lot more that can happen in his realm because he's outside of natural law. Yes, it's convenient, but maybe it's convenient because it logically fits. Go okay, so um, I would just kind of like to uh, go off of what Mariah said. Uh, I mean, how literally can we take the Bible? You know, like she said, it's impossible for us to have descended from Adam and Eve, mainly because Adam and Eve had two children, Cain and Abel, who were both male. So unless somehow they punched through the laws of physics and had children of each other, which they didn't because Cain killed Abel. I mean, <laughs> so clearly we can't take that story literally because... I mean, holy crap. <laughs> no pun intended. But, <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, but then again, like, couldn't you just start saying that about other things in the Bible? Like, okay, we shouldn't take Cain and Abel that seriously. Well, then how can we take anything literally in the Bible? Like the Tower of Babel. Obviously, no one made a tower that could literally go all the way up to heaven because that's 
in our realm of the world, that just does not happen. You would go to space and then you would suffocate and die. Like, you, could not, <laughs> you could not build a tower to heaven. So clearly, you can't take that seriously. But, uh, I mean, sure there are like scientific explanations. Like you said, how we, how we, uh, what was your example? Oh, the red sea. They, they proved how the, red, how the, I mean, how the Nile like, turned red when the uh, moon was locked. Yeah, exactly. Like, sure there's scientific explanations for that. But then again, could there just be scientific explanations for everything in the Bible, rendering the entire thing just one giant metaphor? Like, that's not, I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm just saying it's something to think about. If we could scientifically explain the Nile, and we could scientifically explain how the Red Sea parted, which we did, it, it happens all the time. It's not really special. The Red Sea just parts. It's because of tectonic plates and stuff like that. So, can we just scientifically explain everything? I mean, come on. And plus, uh, I'm going to back up Will, what he was, what he was saying oh. to Byung. That's, I'm backing up Will, so you know something's going on. <laughs> so, I mean, Byung, that's just a convenient way to get out of it. Get out of the whole, like, providing facts. It's like, well, you know, I mean, he's like, you can't understand, man, because he's, like, special. Is that really, like, what you're going to bring to the table? Is that he's beyond our understanding? I mean, I did not just pull out that God began to exist. I used your logic to prove that God, that God had to come into existence. He had to begin to exist. Because you yourself said that things can't just exist forever. So, obviously, if God exists, he had to begin existing at some point. In which case, it's not merely an assumption that, you know, I'm now pulling something out that you didn't say. I'm taking what you said and merely coming to a logical conclusion based on it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> this will be quick. Again, this is very important to notice here. It's not anything that exists has a cause, but anything that begins to exist has a cause. And God has always existed. Therefore, this popping into existence thing doesn't apply to him. All right, and then back to, do we take the Bible literally thing? Well, I take it literally the way it means it. I mean, when Jesus says that I am the door, I don't believe that he literally has hinges and a doorknob. Right? Uh, but, you know, Genesis 1.1, you give me Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the rest of the Bible is really no problem for me to believe. I mean, we be, don't just begin, we don't believe it, it started with a man and a woman. We literally believe that God started with the dust of the earth and breathed into man's nostrils and brought him into existence. So my question would be, if God does exist, could you please explain to me why the one that spoke the universe into existence would not be capable of creating a population starting with two people? Oh, and it doesn't say only uh, Abel and Cain were born from Adam and Eve. It just mentions those are a couple of them that were born. It's kind of like if you see a car accident. Maybe there's five cars involved, but when you tell the story, you only talk about two of them. All right? The Bible's 800 pages, and it covers 1,600 years of history. Uh, you're not going to get all those details that you want. It has one main message to get across. God, man, man falling from God, God filling in the gap through Jesus Christ, and then how you can live with them in eternity.